the recent 20 years, uh, well, or 30 years, uh, Taiwan become more westernized. So the food diet changed from rice-based to wheat-based. We are trying to solve the climate problems, right? So um, basically, we're trying to encourage more people to adopt uh, plant-based diets. And that's why we're trying to make this very new ingredient, fat ingredients, to make the current plant-based products taste more like meat. And Taiwan is actually a gluten-free paradise. We provide a lot of uh, food uh, that does not contain gluten. Hello and welcome to Connected. I'm Tomasz Koper, sitting in for Divya Gopalan. They say that you are what you eat, but in many places around the world over the last few decades, we've seen huge changes in the way people think about food. Whether for health, variety, or for the environment, we're looking for more diverse ingredients in our fridges and spice racks. And for savvy entrepreneurs, that means more opportunities to make and sell unique and innovative food products. To discuss these changes to our preferences, palettes, and business models, we welcome Michelle Lee, the co-founder and CTO of Lipid. Uh, and from Taipei, we have Ivy Chen, uh, who is a food educator, chef, and the co-author of Made in Taiwan, a cookbook that showcases the uniqueness of Taiwanese cuisine. Uh, Michelle, let me start with you. Your company, Lipid, is trying to do something very special in the um, plant-based meats sector. Um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. So, hi, I'm Michelle. So, basically, um, our company, Lipid, um, is specialized in making animal fats from plants, plant ingredients. So, basically, we utilize this fat ingredients that we've created to create the world's best fatty, juicy, plant-based meat. And um, what is very special about ourselves is that our fat ingredients are, um, when you think about plant-based oils or um, fats, they usually comes in the form of liquid, right? And um, we utilize a very special technique to um, transform this liquid form into a solid form, which is usually what um, animal fat performs like. And it can withstand high heating temperatures without... Um, you know, um, the, the whole manufacturing process um, without adding any harmful chemicals into this um, food ingredients. So basically the fat ingredients that we came out or we made, it's called phytofat and um, it can withstand high heating temperatures. It can lock the oils or fattiness and juiciness within the plant-based meats that we are eating right now. Mm -hmm. And um, Ivy, you've been championing Taiwanese cuisine for more than two decades. Um, can you tell us about how preferences have changed, what kind of changes you've seen in that time here in Taiwan? Well, um, I will say in the first 10 years that I started teaching, uh, people still don't know too much about Taiwan cuisine. So they uh, like they like uh, Chinese food. And the Taiwan's food diet has been changed in the past 70 day, uh, seven decades because the wheat products become more dominant to the food diet in Taiwan. And plus the recent 20 years, uh, well, or 30 years, uh, Taiwan become more westernized. So the food diet changed from rice-based to wheat-based. So that's what I see. But in the recent 10 years or 15 years or so, I found that people more have more conscious about uh, that uh, Taiwan actually grow a lot of rice. So we need to focus on rice products more. Let's take a look at two companies that innovate in the food and beverage industry, Twirl Milk Tea from the United States and Empress Hot Sauce based right here in Taiwan. They tell us about how they got started and what challenges they faced. Take a look. Pauline and I have been friends for 20 plus years. About 15 years ago, we talked about starting a food company and when the pandemic hit, we basically went back to our roots. We wanted to look for something that we were nostalgic for, which is bubble milk tea and milk tea. Our moms had made it for us. and. When the shops all closed, everything shut down, Pauline started concocting in her 
home, like plant-based milks, her fridge, her pandemic fridge was full of concoctions of teas and brewed teas. And she was like, I think I found a formulation that really works. And a bit of naiveness, we were like, okay, let's join forces. Let's like take it to market. Let's package it. You know how to design. She was a food and packager for 20 plus years. I know how to do marketing. Like we can totally take this. We can like go nationwide. Everyone will want this amazing formulation that she created. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of our, our journey into doing the Tormulti startup. Hot sauce was a kind of a, a lucky, lucky situation. So when we first moved back to Taiwan, um, my partner Alex, he was really missing a lot of the sauces that he would have in the U.S. And so um, for one day, he was shopping at the wet market in Shiling. And he saw mangoes, like Iwan mango, next to chili peppers. And he's like, oh, well, why don't I try to make something for myself? And so he made a couple batches and it actually tasted pretty decent. So we started gifting it to friends um, for Christmas who were visiting from the U.S. And like, lo and behold, they wanted to bring more back to the States. And that's kind of how we fell into hot sauce, a product and then as a business. So a bit of the challenges was one, just first starting during the pandemic. You know, not very many places were open. So just formulating, actually testing and getting feedback from consumers, having to do all of that online. The second would be actually just entering retail shops. You know, right when we started, there were no trade shows. There were no uh, people gatherings to really, people were really focused on getting a toilet paper or like marinara sauce, right? They were really focused on bubble milk tea. Other challenges were we actually created a whole new category. So milk tea, bubble milk tea, tea lattes is which what we are. That whole category does not exist in the mainstream retail grocery stores. When we started two and a half years ago, Nielsen's wasn't even tracking this category. We created this category and now you know, buyers are so excited about it. I think with every uh, with every startup, at least in Narsic, because it's our first business um, and it's in a field that we weren't really super familiar with, we had a like pretty steep learning curve, I would say, um, because we're learning how to be an entrepreneur and we're learning how to do it in a new country and we're learning how to do it with a new product. And so what's been really helpful is just kind of being able to find incredible partners who are you know patient with us and really kind of holding our hand and teaching us how food is done in Taiwan. I think Taiwan has a, a really stringent food, um, food program, which I think is great. And um, I think that also allows us to be very clear on like what we can do, what we can't do. But I think getting to know it in the beginning, maybe it was language as well, um, was a little bit challenging just to understand. The government actually has set up a bunch of classes for food producers like us or food uh, brands like us. And that's been really helpful to just be able to go there and just ask these instructors all the questions in the world and just to make sure that we're doing things by the book. I would say the food and beverage industry is first and foremost, I think, I think long and hard, you know, whether or not it's a vile product that people want. The second is to realize in a food and beverage, it's a longer game. It's many, many years. It's not as fast of an exit as a tech startup where you might just be able to like have a prototype and like maybe right away, like sell your whole engineering team to somebody. This is a little bit different, um, but it's really, really fun. I would say um, the biggest difference would be tech. You can start with no product and you can raise right away. The food and beverage category, you the milestones and the leaps and hurdles that you have to show that your viability, that your ability to stay for the long haul is much higher. The, you have to have at least a million to two million in revenue. You have to have a product in operations. You have co-packers. Um, you, can, you can't really raise until you have at least a million. And so what tech startup do you know? Do you have to have a million in revenue? <laughs> but they can raise like 10 million or 15 million. And so I would say those are some differences in the tech service. The hurdles are really about brand awareness and the amount of money it takes to get your product out. So Michelle, uh, I want to start with you. How much of that uh, resonated with you? How much of the challenges that those uh, companies faced uh, are similar to the, to the ones that you had to overcome? I think it's pretty similar. They basically um, covered everything that we're facing right now. Um, however, what is kind of different is that um, because we're an ingredient supplier slash final product uh, producer, so basically we have to take care of the manufacturing ourselves too. And because um, we have a very specialized tech, 
that we developed in house by ourselves. So everything have to, you know, uh, come up from scratch. So um, even the production line, we have to design it. Uh, we have to test and trial and error and make sure it went through. And finally, it has to come up with a product and that is deliverable and meet the quality to deliver to our customers. Yeah. Well, uh, Ivy, in your career, you must have seen many companies rise and fall. So what are some of the factors that uh, are make or break for a, a company in the food and beverage industry? Uh, why do some stay around for many years and why do some disappear after a few months? I think this well, should be, be depends on the customer's uh, demand. I think supply and demand should be equal. When people don't like the flavor anymore, someone need to create a new flavor, new food. So then if the company won't change, they will disappear. And based, basically based on the middle age customers, I feel that the elderly customer flavor, their palate not change the market. And the young kids may be also not the mainstream to change the food diet, but then the middle age uh, um, customers, consumer, they were like a lead the food uh, trend, make the food change, and some some company disappear, some new company appear. Well, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was about to ask Michelle, um, who is your who is your product for? Who's the the target demographic? Uh, are uh, those people who are already uh, subscribing to plant-based diets, or are you trying to uh, drag over those who are sticking to meat because it tastes good and they can't live without that? Yeah, so basically the bigger impacts we're trying to solve is to, um, it's for the sustainability issue. We have, we're trying to solve the climate problems, right? So um, basically we're trying to encourage more people to adopt uh, plant-based diets. And that's why we're trying to make this very new ingredient, fat ingredients to make the current plant-based products taste more like meat. Right, so our idea is that we can convince more people by changing the taste or improving the test taste of the current products. Um, and I think um, our target audiences is basically everyone that likes tasty food. So um, we we're not targeting a specific cohort. However, um, I would say right now I I agree uh, with Ivy's um, opinion that. Um, Currently, what we found is that the middle age, uh, mid age, or the younger generations, they are more. They have more tendency to try new types of food, new flavors um, that are infused with either tech, um, technology, um, different flavors, different highlights in the food uh, that makes them feel like it's fun. Um, they're making an impact by um, eating different kinds of food. Well, Ivy, um, how? Uh do you see the changes that are happening in Taiwan? Is it also the sort of middle-aged consumers that are driving um, these push for healthier and more sustainable products? Is one of those more important than the other? Um, how are people approaching these sort of personal and environmental choices in how they eat and prepare food? Well, I would say it's like uh, in Taiwan, at least about 30 years ago, uh, I feel it's we started a agricultural revolution. Kind of people has more conscious on a sustainable agriculture and uh, also keep the environment better, uh, eco friendly. And then there's many people like uh, gave up their uh, original job and go countryside, have a land, and try to grow healthy food. That's become more uh, healthy conscious uh, from the past three decades. And it's been continue until right now. People kind of uh, look for some special ingredients from Taiwan and try to incorporate them in the uh, new cuisine and or in uh, some creative menu. 
Michelle, uh, I want to ask you about the obstacles that are regional preferences. So I know one of your flagship products is pork belly. Uh, but pork belly, uh, for example, in the United States and in Taiwan, tends to be prepared in completely different ways. It's grilled in one country and tends to be braised over here. Um, so how do you overcome those challenges? How do you make your product universal in this way? Yeah, so we tackle with this type of challenges from, you know, um, when we are starting to design this pork belly um, product. So basically because we're looking at a global market, so we're targeting, you know, not only U.S., um, but also European um, countries and also, you know, the Asian countries. So we have to make our product very robust and also very, you know, easy to use. So when we're designing this pork belly, um, actually our, we focus is on using the tech to make sure it can withstand, you know, um, high heating temperatures and also the overall cooking experiences can replace or, you know, replicate the traditional meat um, preparation processes. So let's now check in again with Twirl Milk Tea from the US and Empress Hot Sauce in Taiwan to see what makes their products unique. Have a taste. I think health as a overall trend is there. People who are busy, active. I think once you realize like how much sugar and how many calories are in our bone milk tea, like it's a great experience to have with friends, but on an everyday basis that you could have, you know, we're all, especially in the Taiwanese culture, a lot of us are tea drinkers. That's something that that's our coffee, that's our water. And so tour milk tea is that tea latte that you could have every day without feeling so guilty about it because it is lower sugar, cleaner ingredients. Tea as a whole in the US has been a really stagnant industry, very little innovation, very little change, but we were the first to bring nitro infusion to tea. We were the first to do small family farms in this capacity with pea protein, making a pea base. So those are things that we want to continue to kind of not upset but but change the the narrative that there is so many better for you offerings that consumers and families and parents can have so with empress i think we've always considered it to be a platform to be able to share taiwanese ingredients with the world um, and so with our all of our hot sauces we source locally we manufacture locally um, and the goal is to actually export this internationally and so right now we're exporting to the states canada australia singapore as well so um from conception to the uh, production of a sauce, we actually get inspired by a lot of global flavors as well as um, sauce as well as flavors that we discovered in Taiwan. Um, for pineapple miso, for example, uh, we were actually inspired by an alpha store taco that we had in uh, Mexico City. So we wanted to sort of pay homage to both Taiwan and uh, Mexico when we made this kind of hot sauce. And we realized, well, we can't put pork in a bottle. So what's that kind of umami? Where is it going to come from? And then we scoured uh, Taiwan and we found a really good local uh, miso that provided that sort of savoriness, that saltiness, that umami base level that really helped elevate the sauce. So our pineapple miso, inspired by Mexico, using 100% Taiwanese ingredients to make a sauce that's uh, the best seller for us in Taiwan as well as the best seller in the States, which is, um, think of a global sauce. So our pineapples, our source from Taiwan, our mangoes, our passion fruit juice, our hibiscus, our uh, dragon fruit, everything that's in the sauce, especially our macau, all sourced from Taiwan. And then we have our passion fruit mustard, which is a unique blend of uh, passion fruits, mustards, and Jamaican jerk spices, which makes the entire world kind of like sit in one bottle. So macau itself as a ingredient is very unique. We really haven't been able to find it um, as prominently displayed anywhere else in the world. So we're very, very happy and very, very honored to be able to sort of figure out a way to put it into a sauce and give it wider exposure on the world stage. Its flavors are unlike anything you've ever had. It actually has these sort of lemongrass citrus notes when blended together that produce a very distinct, almost lemon-lime, seersuckery kind of taste, but it is so unique, so wonderful that that story that we get to tell about how it's wild harvested by indigenous uh, tribes 
and then we get to uh, source it from them, get to tell their story, get to see how they've been using it, and then we get to use it in a different way to tell a different story and um, allow the entire world to discover a truly unique ingredient that Taiwan offers. So one of the reasons why we wanted to do this type of product specifically is that like Taiwan has some of the most amazing um, fruits in the world and people really don't know about it. And so one of the things that we've been very excited about is the opportunity to share these stories with these farmers and all of their blood, sweat and tears that go into these fruits and be able to tell that story to a wider audience. And I think what's been really cool has been that like our, our bottles, like we're FDA, like we have the FDA label and everything, but our label in the front says La Tai Ho, right? Empress Hot Sauce. Um, and it's still doing fine. And so I think there's always been this hesitation to be like, oh, it's a very Taiwanese, like Chinese character product. Will it do okay? It's been doing fine in the States and that's been really great to, to see. I'm really proud that we can actually showcase Taiwan in a different way. One with our Taiwan style black, just having Taiwan on the billboards of New York Times in New York, uh, Times Square. We actually just did one where we showcased our tea lineup and we did a video. So just being able to have fun things to have Taiwan show in its own way. Overall, I think Pauline and I would love to encourage more and more entrepreneurs to think about um, ways that they can tie in their heritage and their own personal backgrounds to create products that are better and um, really delicious for others to have as well. You can watch the full version of our Twirl Milk Tea and Empress Hot Sauce feature on our YouTube channel and the Taiwan Plus website. Uh, so Michelle, how important is it for a food brand to tell a story? It's very, it's definitely very important because you have to create um, images in people's head, right? And food is very um, emotional, I would say. So in order to convince people to, you know, taste this kind of products, you have to, you know, tell a very um, intriguing story and to, you know, actually make people mouthwatering and really want to try this product. And um, I think this is a talent that every food maker has to make, has to have, yeah. Well, uh, Ivy, you've been telling the story of Taiwanese cuisine uh, over many years, but most recently in your book, Made in Taiwan. Um, so I'm sure there are many people in, in, in whose minds uh, Taiwanese cuisine is just a subset of Chinese. But your book tells a different story to that. Can you tell us a little more about it? Well, I say food is always stick to the land. If the land different, the country different, the food cannot be the same. Um, Taiwan is lucky to have man, uh, a lot of microclimate uh, 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 environment. So we can grow a lot of almost everything in Taiwan and then make uh, our food unique. And we always uh, incorporate the, all the local produce in our cuisine. So sometimes people ask me, what is the traditional food? I say traditional is moving on. There's a new tradition after another. So people will create a new tradition by the generation and the local produce. If we find more new products in Taiwan, people will add them in the uh, recipe. And that is what we think. Taiwanese food is very unique and it's not belong to anyone else uh, cuisine. So it's the the land, this island country, and uh, the people create the, the flavor, and that make a Taiwan food very special. Well, um, speaking of modernity and tradition, uh, but now focusing more on modernity, Michelle, what is the next breakthrough? What is the next innovation in the food and beverage space that you're excited about? What's around the corner in our pantry, so to speak? So I would say um, there is still a lot of space for in innovation to jump in in terms of, uh, you know, actually creating new innovations around securing food security and also providing, um, you know, more food that are more sustainable. Or a lot of people are working on, you know, using upcycled materials to create, um, you know, either dishes or new food products. Um, that's a very uh, broad uh, space which needs a lot of new, you know, new blood to jump in and to actually create new different kinds of products. 
All right, well, and let's, uh, before we go jump buck, back into tradition for a second, Ivy, is there something unique, special um, that is found here in Taiwan that you feel should be more mainstream and should be recognized more internationally? Well, as the cake geography located in the tropical uh, uh, weather, Taiwan actually grow uh, more rice. So we need to focus on rice products. So like um, I was asked by many customers to make a dumpling and they are talking about wheat based dumpling. But that is actually not a major diet uh, like a couple of decades before. But now of course it's a mainstream but I wish that um, like uh, to to emphasize the products of rice in Taiwan and including the other uh, starch products like sweet potato starch, tapioca starch, um, that should be incorporated into uh, the the mainstream dishes, make uh, the food uh, healthier. Because from my customer, I have more and more requests about gluten free. And Taiwan is actually a gluten paradise, gluten free paradise. We provide a lot of uh, food uh, that's not contain gluten. So I think the to make it uh, mainstream, we need to boost the rice products and make uh, the like rice bowl, rice dumpling more appealing, more delicious, and then the world will accept it. Like. Uh, the way we create bubble tea. I think this will be the next uh, trend. There you have it from the bubble tea capital of the world and also as it turns out a gluten-free paradise. Uh, Ivy Chen, uh, the uh, food educator, chef, and the co-author of Made in Taiwan. Um, thank you very much. Thank you also to Michelle Lee, the co-founder of CTO of Lipid. And to our audience at home, if you would like to be a part of the conversation, visit our YouTube channel where you can leave us comments. You can also follow and interact with us on our Instagram. That's the end of today's show. It's been great to have your company in this mouth-watering journey through food innovation. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and stay connected.